I just, right, why, why do you look at me like that? Is it Thursday? You're good. It's, there's, um, there were like three boxes, but only two of us. Ah, yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm sorry. I realized that, you know, cause I update the post based on whether it's brunch or happy hour. I realized I updated it in the first mention said 6 PM rather than 6.30, so that's probably why there's a good number of people here now. So I apologize, I'm sorry. The, hopefully the YouTube thing showed correctly and the subsequent mention was correct, but I know the first one was wrong, so I apologize. That was, But it looks like there's been fun conversation. As Sean said, virtual gate life. That's, I like that. But make sure you <laughs> so virtually socially distance, so you, know, you don't wanna uh, denounce boarding time was 30 minutes ahead of actual boarding, which is a real pet peeve. I mean, at this point I would take any boarding thing, but you know, there are some airlines that love to post like 60 minutes before, but that never board. Sorry, I'm <laughs> out of it. I'm no, this is perfect. I just had a coffee, so I'm like, ah, da, 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 da. Yeah, this is great. What is everyone drinking since you've all been here for half an hour while we've been doing other things? You should show your drink, Tiffany, because you have a very Oh, I'm nice a martini. So what, what kind of a martini is that? So I prefer gin martinis because I can't drink vodka because I'm like under the table in one drink with vodka. So it is gin, dry vermouth, um, some apricot brandy, and like a tiny bit of lemon juice. Shake vigorously. Serve with enthusiasm. That's legit. That's uh, and I'm just having a white claw because we're out of everything. So out of truly downgrading to white claw. We're just out of vodka. I would my new drink of choice because it's so hydrating and refreshing and just downright healthy is just a lot of vodka with coconut water. Very delicious. Oh, and you know, it hydrates you while dehydrating you. So it's perfect. <laughs> Are you getting to the point where you're serving this in a coconut? Uh, uh, no, we will get there though. It will, it will, uh, um, eventually. So I was telling Tiffany earlier, so long as I, I don't, did I not mention this on a, one of these recently, but like, I miss flying so much that I am thinking of, I'm trying to figure out how I can essentially have an Etihad style service, like except not running out of food, like a good Etihad service at home when people come. Not that I really like guests. I mean, I, I like when right, you come. Right, who's over other than like me and Lainey? Right, it's exactly, so no one. But I'm saying <laughs> in, in my head, look, I'm bored. Or I'm not bored. I'm like, right. I'm dreaming of flying that a tray, it sounds really nice to be able to present people with a tray with a warm towel and you know a date and you know, a, a snack trio. Right. I'm it's, sorry for making fun of you earlier and being like, so Ben, this is actually just basic hospitality. Welcome to actually being home for more than five minutes. But I, like, fair, but warm towels, come on. If you're not offering someone a warm or cold towel, or you're really you know, welcomed them in then, it's, you know, you gotta have white gloves so you can pour the shampoo. Okay, that's Etihad residence, not apartment yeah, levels or stuff. But, yeah. but I so, do have a question that I think would be fun for everybody to answer at this point in time. Ooh, somebody's drinking a nice Pinot. It's a little too hot today for Pinot. I'm sort of a, I know people feel differently about that, but, um, and we'll get to, we'll get to Marrakesh in a second. But since you were talking about this, Ben, but like now that everybody's spending more time at home, are there any like travel inspired things getting added to your space? So I'd like to hear like, Ben, what your aspirations are, what you're thinking, other people, like, what are you, now that you're home more, or just you're, now that you're missing travel, what are you doing or adding? So I'm trying to get the whole KLM house collection. I'm still figuring out how I'm going to do that, but that's part of it. That way I never have to leave home again. And it's also good backup alcohol supply because there's gin in there. So it's something, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Is you it actually gin place. or it's like gin of it or something? Jennifer, I said once that it was gin and somebody got very indignant. They were like, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not so low rent as gin. Like this is whatever. Um, what are you doing? Are there any less literal items that you're adding? Not like, oh, I want this airline branded thing, but. Um, Speaking of airline branded things, what airlines sell their, this is exactly the opposite of what you're hoping for, but what right. airlines sell their silverware where you could buy like, you know, who doesn't want to feel like they're dining on Spirit Airlines or. Okay, so Delta is very proud of having Alessi silverware, which like Alessi is a brand, A-L-E-S-S-I, that you can like buy flatware of. I don't actually like their flatware, I just want the Delta logo, so. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. But Delta does have their, um, we don't want to pay for storage sale every year. <laughs> so you could uh, get, you know, surplus silverware from maybe like five or six design iterations ago. 
It has to be like current. It has to be really. I mean, you'd figure Etihad would be at this point selling stuff. It's not like they're ever going to make the money. Singapore might in the Chris Wire shop. They have a lot of their stuff. Like you can buy their linens and things like that. Um, somebody made cookies. That's good. Somebody's going through travel photos. You people are not shoppers. What kind of cookies? Like the the, the double tree. Oh, the double tree ones. Ah, which which are delicious. But also, in addition to the recipe, they posted the calories online, and that just ruined it. So Right. Ben is um, highly conscientious about the posted calorie counts of things. It's really right. cute. Realize it doesn't, Where it's like, whatever. it's only 100 calories. I'm like, yes, but you just ate the entire box. So it's actually 1,000 calories. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I like a good, you know, 100-calorie snack size, whatever. It's the little uh, whatever form it comes in. It's not logical, but, you know, the well, double-trick cookie. Steve has, uh, obviously, the airline... Shape, salt and pepper shakers, which I, I don't know if those are the nicks from Virgin Atlantic, but using their eye shades from airlines as a face mask, that's been pretty popular. And then they were gifted a Cafe Pacific whiskey snifter glass, and that's being used a lot. Uh, oh, whiskey what? Snifter? Yeah. They're like the big... Uh. Um, okay, sorry. I was thinking of Brandy. So I have one. I can go and get one, but they're... But Cafe Pacific has them on board? I would... I, I would... It would make sense to have the little whiskey snifter glasses on board because they're only like this big. You remember when we went to the Scotch whiskey experience, we all got the little glasses with the Scotch white and they had like the five or six, but they're small. They're just like slightly bigger than shot glasses. Ah, okay. Uh, got it. Okay. That's smart. So, Jordan has thin air glasses. That's fun. Jordan, did Ooh. you s steal those or did yes. you buy Where those? You Are they like the Mary Mako ones or... So what I'm trying to optimize is, you know, Etihad, they have the little tray with the snack. So if you were to welcome people into your home and you wanted to provide them with three snacks um, to go along with an alcoholic beverage and you had to consistently have the same three snacks, which would you do? Um, yeah, so I do this because I, you know, lived in, lived in Italy where if you invite somebody over and you don't have 87 appetizers, um, like that, that's just not done. It's not a thing that happens. So oh, um, I would generally say olives are a good option, especially with the sticks are good. I mean, are you serving, what time of day? Are you serving coffee or are you serving cocktails? No, alcohol. Coffee is a different story. So coffee, I also need to know what to accompany with, but Okay, alcohol. so if you're doing cocktails, I would do, you can't go wrong with like olives and nuts. And then you could do a third thing. Some people like like a, like a small seeded crackers, like the small, like cheesy crackers or things like that. I mean, I can't ever eat the crackers, so I'm always happy to see the olives and the nuts. Brilliant. Okay. See, the, the problem with olives is, is, the way I see it is, there's no... Or like a marinated just... feta is also nice. Ooh, that's that's. Good. And then you have two uses for the skewers, so that's really nice. But the problem with olives is there's no terrible way there's no non-terrible way to eat olives because whatever so you put it in your mouth but then the pit and then you just like what you take your hand it's just well you got to have your cocktail napkin and just deal with that it's just such a process i love okay, the idea, i actually I, I know andrew that you just said that you live in a small space in new york um i actually love that you're eating caviar with potato chips so if you want to come and hang out with me in spokane we can literally just sit in my yard and do that sounds amazing because i love caviar I love when it's served with a spoon. I hate when it's served with like an entire loaf of bread because like I can't eat the bread. And if you're having a high enough quality of caviar, you don't have to have like, you know, six cups of onions and four eggs and everything else. Sorbet is great, but Air New Zealand serves a great sorbet. That's true, but it's probably a little impractical for just having ready to go. The thing is, Ben, if you're going to do this um, when people come over, even or especially if those people are just me and your mother-in-law, um, it's important to not have it feel rushed because you know, there's nothing worse. Like when you've boarded the flight and you're still trying to get situated and you're like trying to take your pictures and someone's like, Hey, here's your dates and your champagne. Like, ah, I don't have room to put all of this. That's so true. You ideally want to give people a moment to like sit down. First you, know, you need to offer them a warm towel. Feel and comfortable, give them a chance to go in and like in these days and days, like wash their hands for 20 minutes, you know, tell them where then, the emergency exits are. Mm-hmm. Now, what would you put with coffee is the question. So with coffee, it has to be something, assume you don't have guessed that often. So it can't be like something that is has to be gotten from the bakery or whatever. But it, at the same time, it should be nice. I don't want you to like walk or shortbread cookies. It has to be something you can take out of individual packaging so right. that you can then present it with a coffee. So it has to have um, some like. Right. So 
I have a couple thoughts on this for coffee because it's like how big of a coffee setup are you doing? Like I, you've seen my coffee tray. It's very small. Like so that, or like something. the highest place Heathrow. Remember they had a nice coffee setup. So you could do a glass of water, a warm towel, a thing, a little thing of milk potentially on the side if somebody wants yeah. it and then a little snack. So I think that's, you could, I think biscotti is fine. Like I can't eat the biscotti typically, but you can get biscotti and you can get them where they're individually wrapped in the thing or just get them once a month, you know, or whatever. This is fun. Now I have a new hobby. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I also feel like nuts are appropriate to serve next to coffee or dates. Well, because like, I, again, like I can't eat the biscotti, but I'm happy if there's like some nice, like those, um, We've had those um, Marcona almonds together with the rosemary. Those are a little bit too much with coffee, but they also do one with the truffle oil, which, you know, sort of a nice contrast in the afternoon. Um, and yes, all the, or you could do like little dark chocolates Ooh. wrapped up. Ooh, this is so fun. Oh my God. I'm going <laughs> to do like I'm gonna um, so much effort into this and then it'll be a great blog post maybe. Yeah. I also like cubed like a very sharp cheddar is sometimes nice next to a coffee. It's like that contrast, right? Because there's so much bitterness in the coffee. So it's the same thing as like the dark chocolate. But, you know, a lot of options. Um, mm. Somebody is asking what I'm drinking. I'm drinking a um, martini. It's an apricot martini. I guess I could type in the recipe here for people who want the proportions. Catering decisions. Budget. Oh, that's Sean is right. I hope you realize that the number one consideration in any airline catering decision is budget. So I would like the full tray, including the alcohol, to cost 36 cents. So if anyone has tips <laughs> um, for how I can meet that, please let me know. Amazing. <laughs> Ooh, I'm not, yeah, I mean, you know. And the other problem is they have to be individually packaged enough so that I don't literally just go and eat all of it while and drunk one night. Them. Exactly. So they have to be individually packaged and like with a lockbox so that I don't. You know, go to town on them. So yeah. So this is a, actually a fun question. Nick and I have been talking about this. Are I can buy like a bag of tortilla chips, and they can stay in the house for maybe a year because I'll have like six chips. If they're in the house and I don't hide them from Nick, he'll be like, "I ate the entire bag of tortilla chips for breakfast." Which are you, and which is Ford? Uh, at this point, we're both, I think, the latter category. Like, what did I see today? It's like pandas eat 12 hours a day, and so do people in, you know, which is true at this point. So, yep, no, that's anything that is delicious will not stay here, and that's why it needs to be, you know, specially uh, packaged somehow. So that's uh, these are there's some really good I ideas. This is actually here. the thing, like letting people sort of get here before us and sort of – this is just going to be a better day, I can tell. Um I love that Susan is asking about my hair. We could have a whole hair conversation. Yes, it is naturally curly. And I hated it until I was like 25. But um, it's more what product do I not use? And the answer is shampoo. So, yeah. That's what, Never? What? <laughs> huh? Do you, uh, is there a conditioner or you just wet it all? Is? No, I use like tons of conditioner. And I will use like a conditioner to shampoo. Like, to, you know, and then I'll use a separate conditioner and then like mousse and gel and it works out well when I'm home because I sort of have, you know, the assortment <laughs> of product yeah. options. But it's difficult when I travel because I don't like to check a bag. And so not all these things come in no, small. That's a... Yeah. So you're like Justin here. You're like, I buy a bag of chips and I don't make it out of the parking lot. Yes. I mean, why would you? It's just so uh, it's that's that's the thing. Ford has now started to cook, which is fantastic because. I have no temptation to go into the fridge and like eat raw chicken or right. to, we have a, what is it? A butternut squash or no, no, a mm. spaghetti squash. Yes. I don't know how the hell it's going to work, but, uh, Does you know, he need I'm instructions not... on that. Uh, we'll see. We, he'll figure it out. Cause you've had that at time. my house a couple times. Yeah, it was very good. I think that was the inspiration, but, um, the, the, we have, he has been making stuff in the Instapot you got us. Thank you. And it's surprisingly yeah. easy because it seems like none of this should actually work, but it does. Because like it actually turns out amazingly well every time, so it's it's magic. Like it's, I don't I don't use the Instapot as much as like the Instapot fans, but I did make a curry in it last night, and it was nice because rather than tending to something on the stove for ten hours, it's like fifteen minutes in the Instapot, which is nice. My grandmother used to have a pressure cooker. Like pressure cookers are not new. Instapot just has been the first to like really market it really successfully. Um, and hers sat on the stove. So it was literally like a bomb basically. Cause when they're sealed and they're growing pressure, it's really just not very safe. 
So I would never do that. But the electric one. So like a day. bomb? A bomb. It's a because bomb. it's high pressure ah, on top bomb. of your stove. Okay, and if it's you like, like bump bomb. it. Okay. Got it. Makes a little more sense. Yeah. Um, I think that's really fun. I'm looking at other things that people are talking about for snacks. So I feel I like you're going to have to review how... all of this. What, what are people saying with snacks? Well, somebody was talking about like diced mozzarella, you know, in mm -hmm. oil, having popcorn maybe. See, and then, so the other challenge is I try in some ways to be very practical. So I would like to do, this is maybe like when Larry David opens Latte Larry's and his two priorities with opening it are um, having urinals where you can only pee correctly, like that's his priority with the coffee shop and um, that the cup stays hot. That's like all he cares about and getting Mocha Joe out of business, different story. Anyway. Um, so I do have concerns about like, okay, what could you present to somebody that's just not a disaster waiting to happen, you know, cause oily or whatever else, you know, uh, somebody mentioned earlier that the biscottis, they crumble to the other side of the room. Like that's not untrue. I think the biscotti is the best <laughs> idea, but they do crumble like hell. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder why airlines serve certain types of food when like, I'm like, you know, there's no way in hell people are going to eat this without it going everywhere. It's like, you can't eat a biscoff without it right. being there. Right. And people are recommending things that I love, like chips and salsa and guacamole. But that's not a great thing to just like put out in your living room necessarily. Depends. Like you have a white sofa, so that would not end well. Um, and I have a Weimar on her. So you have a tail situation. So, yeah, that seems with. challenging. Ugh, well, so much fun inspiration. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, so that's I'm that's gonna, super I'll, fun. I'll report back on how that goes when it, stuff ships in like two years probably. So. Right. No kidding. Um, yeah. The shipping situation is something else. That's right. That's so, right. yeah. Okay. What are, sorry. I know there were a lot of questions we've not gotten to. So I, no, it's okay. There actually haven't been a lot of questions. We've been talking about just like stuff. What other airline things are in people's homes? I'm just thinking here because. So, well, somebody asked, and I think I lost it, but like, if we had space, would you have, airline inspired or airline salvaged furniture and maybe I think maybe because I think it can be a little too um over the top like there's some really cool desks that are like I'm made from a wing of an aircraft and like that looks cool mm -hmm. but also maybe it's too much and they take up a lot of space and they're very heavy I did see a desk made out of an engine cowling that I thought was really fabulous because it would work in like a smaller space because, you know, it's circular. So you could set it in a different places. Um, I remember you used to want to have an airline galley cart for like a bar cart. Yes. Yeah. Ah, thank you for mining. Ford's Ford just died a little bit from across the house. You. I'm sorry, Ford. That is, uh, I'm going to start rolling through <laughs> mm -hmm. home, being really mean with credit card applications, offering people beverages my credit card reader, eight dollars. Yeah, I think sounds great. Um, uh, would you do like a bank of airline seats ever in your house? I don't think it's practical enough because it's one thing if it were a modern seat, like I'd put a Q suite somewhere. I think that would be cute, but like you know, a 1992 like recliner business seat isn't actually comfortable enough that I want to sit in it versus a couch for, for any period as of cool time. As it yeah. looks. I would get left to my own devices, like one of those huge model airplanes, like the one to 50 scale or whatever. That's like, you know, oh, sorry, you can't see me stretching my arms, but that's one of those. But again, I don't think that would receive household approval, but it would be very cool. Yeah. That's actually possibly even grounds for divorce. Yeah, I mean, one to 50. So the really, it has to be one of the really big ones though. Like, yeah. Okay. So Tim has a mirror made from a plain window. That sounds amazing. And like the right scale, hang it on the wall. Like it's not in the way. That'd be fun. Tim, you should tell us that, where you got that because I would totally add that to my office. Airline branded teaspoons. That's interesting. Airline branded teaspoons. See, I used to love collecting things, but then like when I moved into hotels, I realized collecting things is really stupid because it's just clutter that is a pain in the ass to get rid of. So in many ways that whole experience helped me because I don't collect anything anymore. But I sort of sometimes do wish I, you know, had something to some goal to like snag something from every plane or something. Yeah. But, well, cause you are innately a, like you are inherently a collector, like as a personality yeah. type. So that's, so, that's a conflict. The I'll need to figure out what I can collect. Yep. Yeah. So.
somebody's pointing out um, that their parents have a whole bunch of airline playing cards and they're asking, did that used to be a common thing to give out? I think it was before the days of IFE, right? Like the Starlux Airlines, I got a deck of playing cards. So, you know, oh, I also got an email, you know, because I'm a Starlux Airlines Insider Ultra Uber VIP top tier elite, thanks to my status match with them. Um, I got an email from yesterday saying, please confirm your address because not only do they want to send me a membership card, it was like an automated email, but also a gift that you can take with you on every flight. So it's a face mask. Oh my God, that would actually be very smart. And I would love a Starlux Airlines face mask because it would probably be very cool. But uh, here's to hoping they fly again soon. Yeah. I should really be outraged that my Starlux Airlines insider status has not been extended by 12 months. It's already valid mm -hmm. for 2020. Outrage is a word. Or you could yeah, just get it uh, for it. Um, so Matthew is asking, and I, we've had so many people asking about this, literally a few hundred questions a day. What are you doing right now with your Virgin Atlantic Flying Club Miles, given the Virgin Atlantic situation? Uh, I know that you so would, maybe don't love answering this on every happy hour, but like I've people are to concerned. write a post about this, so I will yeah. get there. But, well, I have an interesting take on this separately, but um, nothing, because there's no point really in redeeming right now, because if it is a partner redemption, it's not necessarily going to be honored in the event that they go out of business. Uh, typically partner awards you pay, the airline pays the other airline at the time that you travel. So it generally won't be honored in the event that it, you know, the airline goes out of business. Personally, I don't think Virgin Atlantic will actually liquidate. So I am not worried. I'm doing nothing with my miles, but this has given me new appreciation of, you know, they do, I know Greg frequent miler, he did the whole Necker Island thing for 1.2 million Virgin Atlantic miles. And I think now it's 1.5. But for fun, I've just been playing around with the numbers of that in my head. Because I'm like, if there is a transfer bonus from Amex, I know it's a lot of points, but if there's a transfer bonus that's like 30% or something, is there any way to justify Necker Island? I think I'll have to go back and actually read his post as to whether it was good, because I don't recall him particularly. Well, I think uh, part of what he really loved about it was the camaraderie, because it's more like, less like a hotel and more that you're staying Never mind. I have zero interest now. Done. And so you're having like communal meals and oh. hanging out with Mr. Branson himself. And I think you'd hate it personally. Okay. I'm done. Sorry. I, the, the, that, yeah. Can like ask him how all his businesses are going. Right. Virgin right. Cruises, Virgin right. Atlantic, Virgin Australia, Virgin. Okay. So Peter has a right. fun question. And I was actually thinking about this earlier today. He's saying like, what's the, what have you noticed like the coolest um, eye mask? And they've heard that there's one from London made that's done in Italian leather. I don't know about that. But what I was thinking about are what are your favorite non-Ramoa airline amenity kits that you've received? Favorite non-Ramoa airline amenity kits. Ooh. Okay, so uh, is it AMA that has, is it Ginza skincare or something in the kits? Mm -hmm. I know it's not kits specifically, but like no, there are some... No, not the contents. Let's talk about the exteriors, so like non remoa So talking about the exterior. Okay. Let's start with that. Then we'll talk about contents. So part of me being less cluttered of a person is I actually have stopped caring about amenity kits, which wasn't the case before. But which ones are actually nice? Um, I mean, I love the Emirates tote bag, actually, that they give you on the A380 that you're supposed to take to the shower. That's right. not the We have so stuff. many of those. Like that is our farmer's market tote. Yes. So it's, you know, that's nice. Um, I don't know what kits are actually nice. What do people like? Uh, Aaron, New Zealand. Yeah, so you guys should tell us like, what are your favorite, just talking about the case itself, things that you've really liked. Um, I had a couple that I was thinking of because I really like when they're practical. So like the Ramoa ones were, are fun because they're great for stashing like your electronics or whatever. Like they make great throw in the bag kits. Um, so Virgin Australia had one that was a passport wallet for a while. And I thought that was fun. Like that's something practical that people can use and they would be using all the time. Um, I like the British Airways first bags. It was like a done by Liberty London, at least the yes. ladies kit was, which was nice. Um, Qatar did some bricks ones that were neat. So like, I like cases that are helpful for using again. So the worst ones I think are actually Virgin Atlantic's new ones, which are like a waxed paper bag. 
And I understand mm-hmm. it's very eco-friendly, but it's actually just more packaging. Well, and okay, so that- Other people should... disagree with me because like Shanjaya here is like, I don't like the hard ones. Well, so it depends, I guess, what you're trying to put in it. Because if it's you're trying to put like cords in it, that's a different story than if you're trying to put something that is more sensitive. Okay, now here's the question is, for example, you did the same Emirates first fair a couple of years ago where you flew from like US, you know, we did LA, Dubai, Milan, Dubai, LA. So uh-huh. over the course of that, you're picking up eight huge amenity kits, eight um, pajamas, if you're two people, I'm saying so mm-hmm. four segments. Like at some point when I take these trips, it's like half of the crap that I'm dragging back is amenity kits and pajamas. Mm-hmm. Right, but on, at least on Emirates, they, are, they also give you the tote, so it's fine. They give you the tote, but then by the end of the flight, I'm walking on planes with my two carry-ons and like three totes filled to the brim. And like, yeah. what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah, so we, um, we actually planned for that a little bit because um, on that particular trip, I had had a duvet cover shipped to the Park Hyatt in Milan. You had a duvet cover shipped to the park. Yeah. Well, because it was, I wanted a certain one. They stopped selling it. Like once I picked out what I wanted um, and it was an Irish designer and she closed her storefronts and you couldn't get the size that I needed for my guest room in the U S so you could get it in the, in Europe, but they would only ship to your European address. And I was like, okay, well I'll be in Europe soon. So it was either like, do I send it to a friend in London and get it when I'm there, or I can just send it to the park height in Milan. So we planned our luggage around, you know, bringing that back. So we had extra space. Fair enough. For, for that, for that trip. But I'm still like, like this entire thing behind me, not the whole thing, just one section of it is full of like those Emirates bags. And somehow at this point now that we're inside for how long, I can't find another pair of pajamas other than my Japan Airlines ones. So... I don't know what the hell happened. Are you just saying that for fun, for the happy hour, or just... No, no, our 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 storage room slash whatever room over there is in a mess, and it has a bunch of boxes, and I have we have not in in a long... Etty had ones that they Ford modeled with like... Oh yes, La Premier does have a box. There's not much in it, which it's very weird because it's just totally empty. So I'm having a white cloth to the person who asked a mango one, which is the best one. Yeah, Mike is pointing out that like the the men's Emirates amenity kits are kind of big. Like, let me show you guys because these are actually ridiculous. Oh, they do have a. I feel like this is just unnecessary. Is that the men's Emirates one? I think so. I don't know, but like. I mean, well, they also have those happened. BS um, pajamas that are allegedly temperature moderating or whatever, which yes, I don't buy. But uh, shaving cream and a read. Yeah. Did, okay. Here's my question for the things with shaving things. The mm-hmm. amenities that have shaving cream and razors. Do people really shave on planes? Like, who is shaving on a plane? Even in the Emirates A3D shower, I'm not gonna shave on a plane. Is that just me? Like on a plane? Um, I think that's just you. <clears throat> Most people are going to like a 737 max lab and like shaving. I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but it seems like maybe it's because was there a period from where you couldn't bring your razor through TSA and people still think that that's a thing or I recall. It's, uh... <laughs> yes. Kevin totally guessed what my duvet cover was. That's funny. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd show you guys, but it's sort of a hassle to walk into the guest room, and it's a mess. The entire house it is a disaster zone, because we've been here for a really long time, and the housekeeper has not. What other fun... Open Skies pajamas. Open Skies had pajamas? Right, it's whatever you brought with you. <laughs> yeah. Have one perfectly sized for a mini Kindle. Yeah, the... Hmm. Do they have special Hello Kitty pajamas? Uh, not pajamas, uh, amenity kits? I don't think so. Um, no, they were Ramoa when we did it. Right? Ah, okay. I mean, that's the best of both. Yeah, I mean, some people are like, maybe they, maybe they shave in the lounge later. I don't know. But then in the lounge, they, most arrivals lounges or whatever also have shaving kits available. So. Yeah, then yeah. everyone has, has their things. I mean, I don't know. This is the thing with a lot of with a lot of these airline things, it's they have them because there's some expectation. 
And so it's just part of, I guess, what people expect to see. That's true. I mean, I don't think Singapore Airlines is wrong for them saying, basically, we're not going to do this because it's wasteful and stupid. Like, I actually support that as a concept because, you know, what stuff in the kids you really use and the items are all available. I mean, I used to love it, but now that I'm not trying to collect everything. Yeah. Like, I used to also collect all airline menus, which seemed like a great idea at the time. But then um, if you fill a big box with menus, you know, it is as heavy as you would expect and it is not mm -hmm. ideal. Yeah, I kind of, I mean, I remember when we were going through, like, your Seattle apartment and, like, the entire closet full of airline menus. I'm like, this is not compatible with living in hotels. No. So I think Good luck. All, uh, <laughs> which is sad, but uh, that's... So Virgin Atlantic Mouse, are there any ways to cash them out otherwise? That uh... No, I mean, you could transfer them to Hilton, but that doesn't really seem like a better option. No. I'm surprised they haven't cut off Hilton Redemptions. Right. Um, I sort of think Jimmy and Jordan and I were talking about this, that if someone's like really concerned, maybe it makes sense to book some Delta flights because given the relationship, it seems like Delta would probably honor them. Not like a hundred percent, but more likely than like A and A. That's perhaps true. In some ways, you know, Delta is selectively generous. So I don't know where that falls on the selective scale of Delta being Delta because, uh, they, right. you know, yeah, I mean, that's true. It's, uh. I only have, I think, like 100,000 or 150,000 Virgin Atlantic miles, and I hope to use them eventually, but... Uh, right, I just got the Virgin credit card last fall, so I have a whole bunch. Well, so I'm I sure. might book for Japan next year, maybe, and then just, like, whatever happens, happens. That's sort of what I'm thinking. I, just, I can't imagine they're going to go out of business at the end of the day, because, A, that would be awful for competition in the U.K., B, I know there's Especially now that there's so much bad press happening with um, like Wizz Air and getting some money from the government and British Airways being generally asshats. Yeah. That <laughs> there just I mean, it would be does seem terrible for aviation there. And uh, Virgin Atlantic, just to me, everything about the flying experience with them is actually sort of pleasant. It's kind of like flying Delta within the US versus, I don't know another Dallas-based airline or whatever, but like consistently fly them. I'm like, oh, they're pleasant. They're nice. Wow, everybody is kind of nice. Like what's going on? I'm confused. Right. Yeah, if I were in that, like flying heavily in that market and like really just needing to go back and forth between New York and London, that seems like that's your obvious choice in terms of frequency and the product and, you know, if that's what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, I mean, then again, I hate the fact that they don't have immediate plans to put, I mean, prior to this, they didn't have plans to put their new business class on the 787s or on the whatever. I hate the heron bone seats on the 787 and A330. They're pretty bad, but uh, A350 was nice. It's, uh, but at the same time, the majority of their flights are like six hours long. So <laughs> does it really matter? Sitting there facing someone and it's like just hard as hell and then you turn it over and, but they're so nice. So that's, Right, they're so nice and they're very fun. Yeah. My best story with that is, so my cousin Heather and I, we flew, um, Virgin Atlantic was the first business class flight that I took her on. And I don't remember where we were going or what the route was. Maybe out of LA. Oh, what's when we were going to Spain. No, it wasn't. It was the trip before that. So we flew somewhere on whatever flight and they were like so sassy and so fun. And there's the whole thing, like they set, the, set it up so we could sit together and like there's the salt and pepper shakers. And it was of course her first time in business class. So they're actively encouraging her to nick the you know cutlery and everything else. And it was just so fun. And then you get to London and there's the arrivals lounge and, oh, she was coming to Sicily is what it was. So there's all of that, just a lovely experience. And then when we were going to Madrid a couple of years later to meet you, we met in Austin and we flew British Airways first and we're on the plane for like 90 minutes. And she turns to me, she's like, okay, so what is the difference between business class and first class? Well, British Airways is the airline on which to ask that question. That's uh, yeah. that is true. It's, because it was so much like, wait a second, we're getting all the same things. Like there's pajamas, there's. It's true. You know, and even on British Airways, especially odd now that they have, you know, doors in business class, but not in first class on the same plane. Just, a very odd airline. It's a little awkward. 
It's a little awkward. Yeah, but... Well, so it, it's just amazing in general, Virgin Atlantic, how good their culture is. Because, for example, in the clubhouse in the U.S., they use, is it Sodexo employees or whatever the ground handling? Mm -hmm. So these are the same people who work largely in the flagship, like Admiral's Club or Flagship Lounge. So at least the flagship lounge at JFK also has Sodexo employees. Mm -hmm. And the Virgin Atlantic Clubhouse has Sodexo employees. But they're so nice at the clubhouse. So it's funny because, you know, I used to go there a fair bit and maybe had a few too many drinks there once and whatever. Um, they remembered me, whatever. Time for a different... Uh, anyway, so I was in the flagship lounge a couple of years ago and I recognized a guy. I'm like, wait, that's whatever his name is. And he was in the Virgin Atlantic Clubhouse before. And I guess he got moved over there. But like somehow they're very friendly over there because I guess it's more of a fun vibe versus... Yeah, I mean, that, and that makes a difference too. It's just like yeah. the vibe is fun you know, and... I think all work environments have that. Like if there's whatever's happening, it's just there's different things that are going on that just makes it more enjoyable and people are just more enthusiastic to be there or all of that. Yeah, I agree with Euro here that more airlines should do what Air France does with La Premiere and do the curtains because it seems like that should be a cheaper modification than putting these really heavy doors in. Yeah, that's more. But also maybe not because how do you attach them? I mean, it's a lot more private. It's the only fully enclosed thing other than Emirates. Uh, I just right. wish. It but you have the cabin wall helping in the front and back. So you're just doing the yep. curtains on the side. Like that's the thing I think people forget is La Premiere is just one row. But so they, they have like a bar along the top. It's kind of like intra your business class where they have a bar because they can move that way the cabin forwards and backwards. The problem is Air France on 777, they don't have air vents, which it sucks when you have no airflow and they have the thing. That's the only downside to that. Yeah. You've got to have individual yeah. air nozzles if you do that. So let me answer this quickly because Matthew's asked a couple times, um, can I do a Marrakesh blog post? I am going to do a trip report from Marrakesh and also from Iceland, but I've just been waiting for things to calm down a little bit because there's a lot going on and they take me a really long time. Like however long they take Ben, it's, it takes me about three times as long to write as it takes him. Well, um, it take a while either way. Hmm? I said they well, take no, a long like it's just the reality. Like yeah. there are other things that I do three times faster than you, like negotiating a grocery store or cooking something. But like the blogging takes me roughly three times longer. Like something that takes you 15 minutes takes me 45. So that's just how long they take. Um, they're thinking about Amangina versus Royal Mansour versus the Mandarin Oriental. Leaning Royal Mansour. I didn't say it, any of those, but I would... The thing is, if you go outside Marrakesh, it's like you can be in the Medina or like just outside the um, Royal Mansour and La Momonia are like right outside the Medina. Like those are really good locations. Or you can do a Riyadh in the Medina, which is what I did and really enjoyed. If you do like Amangina or the Mandarin, they're far. It's like 25 minutes from the Medina. So if you're just going for like the sun, you go there, but at that point, you might as well just go to Palm Springs. Like, there's not. <laughs> it's just like, oh, look, it's in a gated golf course community. Like, it's not really. I know it's very popular, especially for Brits to go down and enjoy the sun, but keep like, that's why you're going if you stay there. It's not for the cultural experience of going to Morocco at that point, which may also be a selling point. So, yeah. Um, some of these other questions. Um, so Robert has a question for you, Ben. Recommended award ticket destinations that have lower taxes, like leaving from Brazil or Hong Kong have lower surcharges. What other ones are there? I mean, I think more just book through the right program and it's a non- issue so you which of course right <laughs> i mean so you know some airline or some frequent flyer programs have carrier imposed fuel surcharges or sorry carrier imposed surcharges or fuel surcharges depending on how you'd like to refer to it whether it's the truth or what they try to get away with um so there are some regions where there are laws against fuel surcharges unrelated to the specific airline i think brazil had that for a while but if i'm not mistaken i think was it Hong Kong or Brazil that reversed it? Um, so you could talk about the regions, but I think more than that, just 
I avoid programs that have fuel surcharges because, you know, British Airways, like going to Brazil and flying British Airways still is not much of a prize. So I feel like there are better options out there. Um, that's why, for example, for Star Alliance, I like to book through Avianca or United, or you book the right partners through Aeroplan. You know, for example, Aeroplan, you can book Transatlantic without fuel surcharges on United, what, SAS, Swiss. I think they're very low for Turkish or non-existent. A lot Polish, they're pretty low. They're, they're super low. Like, it's not, so just, Turkish, it's like not that they're, like, there are surcharges, but it's like yeah, $5. And then In other lot, words, they're like and yeah. you're fine. Um, <laughs> which in general now is probably the case. Um, well, like no new business class. Lord knows how many planes will have first class when this is all done. Probably very few. Right. right. Um, yeah, that's... So I'm wondering if they're going to start closing first because, you know, I've been going back in my head, you know, living in the past, thinking of all the nice travel memories because that's what we do when we're on the ground. And it's easy to get sort of nostalgic and almost sad about it. And obviously there are things that are better now versus that were before, but like I'm going back a long time to like when Lufthansa on the 747-400 had 16 first class seats. And, yeah. you know, when Turkish was wet leasing, uh, tight, was it tight Airways 777s? Oh, sorry, Jet Airways yeah. 777s. Yes, the Jet Airways 777s. Or when you could like consistently redeem miles for Swiss first. Yes. So thinking Cafe back on to the 74. All the times without fuel surcharges, like when Aeroplan had no fuel surcharges on any airline. Yeah. Okay, that's the weird thing about Aeroplan is that, you know, the way it was in the past was they had fuel surcharges on Air Canada, but not on any other airline, which seems odd, you know, counterintuitive <laughs> to incentivize people in that way to travel on other airlines. But uh, Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure that they had a reason for it, and that reason may have just been that no one had done the math. But it's interesting to hear you say that. I was um, on the phone with Randy on Tuesday, Randy Peterson, and you know we were talking about just travel and if things would come back to normal. And he's like, you know, I think I might not travel anymore because I don't want to have my memory of how magical and lovely and inspiring travel was to be ruined by all this new hassle. And like Randy's been everywhere, right? He's done all the things. And so at this point, he's just like, maybe... Maybe the way it is in my memory is perfect. Just fair. And at the same time, like 15 years ago or whatever it was, 16 years ago, I would have said, ah, well, if I can't even take a bottle of water through security anymore, like why would I want right. to fly? Right. Like I can't bring water. What right. the hell? So I don't know how much of that is just adjusting to the circumstances and everything will be dandy again or if it really is. And I, and I can't decide, does this – Let's say, for example, that face masks become not even just necessarily required, but in general, if they become more in the future part of the travel experience, does that make the benefit of first or business class travel greater or worse? Because on one hand, it's greater because you have space, you have social distancing potentially or more space at least, and you can close your suite door and whatever. But at the same time, like, how are you going to eat caviar and champagne? You know, you lift your mask yeah. and it just takes the fun out of it a little bit. So I don't know if... Uh, I don't know which we'll way see. that goes. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be time. Are you on your second drink yet? First. Hmm. Okay, that's probably fine then. So Amir has a question. Did you hear back from TPG when you called them out the other day? And also, can we clarify if we're the owner of the points post trademark? I will clarify I the second part before you do the first part. And the second part is yes, we do. And that's a very long story that neither set enough drinks for. But we do own that trademark. And so the first part, no, I have not. So, uh, but I, I did see, I think today that they instead referred to it as a P plus M expert or something. Um, so they were learning. And but they, so. Well, no, I mean, the thing is, oh gosh, I have had enough to drink to say this. Um, so maybe I won't. Um, they, they read, they resent the same tweet today. And I, I hate to say it, but I think that the people who monitor their, social media are maybe not used to people responding. Is that an okay way to say that? I mean, that's very accurate. It's a few. I, I, yeah, that's uh yeah. And Amir saying, so are you the North Dakota based company? No, it's the patent office hasn't updated their website. We own the trademark though. So, we could have a whole separate conversation about the North Dakota-based company, but not today. 
I mean, are we supposed to explain the wait what happened? Do you want to provide a brief? Uh... I mean, I can, I'm happy to. So it's actually like a sort of a cute but sad story. So there was somebody several years ago, um, and this was like, it was at a very busy time, right? Like it was right after that. Oh, sorry, I think the wait what happened question is in reference to the overall what the hell are we talking about to begin with rather okay, well, than you can talk about that. And let me ask the North Dakota thing. So, but there was somebody who basically, um, created a business of the same business that we had with points pros, except they were calling it points pro. And they had a really smart idea for having like videos and e-courses and things like that. But the problem was they used like all of our name and all of our branding, including like the exact language that was on the website. So I called him, you know, and it's friendly because we're all in this miles and points space and just like, Hey, and I feel so badly because the kid was like 17. Right. And so it was like, okay, like I understand like it's imitations is you know best form of flattery, but you really can't do this. And this is why, and you need to change your name. And I, how can we help you with doing that? And it was a really nice phone call, but then he got off the call and created an LLC with our name and then filed for a patent. And we did this whole thing that got a little, you know, less pleasant to resolve it. And as part of it, he was supposed to withdraw the patent and it just became a whole, a whole thing. So we own it. That's just the saga. So do you want to talk about your. Or not. Okay. I mean, no, it's fine. People, you can fall, you can look on Twitter. If you look, you can, Tiffany can link to the Twitter, I guess that's uh, maybe if you, cause I don't can know, I? I'm saying yeah. Tiffany can, because I don't know how the hell to put stuff. Or I don't think I'm capable of putting it in the chat thing. Right. Yeah, I can do that. But people are so happy. They're like, they want to hear the drama. I mean, you could type it in over here, see where it says one mile at a time, say something. So I'm not looking at that thing because I, I have the comments open on my phone because if I do it on there, it, it there's too, too much room. Like my laptop struggles to keep Skype going without sounding like an A380 taking off. So yeah, you need a new computer. I will get there. I will get there. So, um, Yeah, so some people are asking if you've met Brian and if we get along with him in person. I would say, I mean, you can answer yep. yes to both. I have, yes. And yeah. yes, I, mean, I, haven't, I mean, I haven't seen him in years. Um, but yes, I mean, yes. Yeah, you guys were, yeah, it's all, it's all friendly. It's fine. Um, I'm looking for your Twitter drama. There's it not that like, much stuff there, so it's... Uh, it's what there's not not that much drama. Yeah, it's only you've oh, only no, had like what like six hundred posts. So, I mean, and to be clear, none of none of the drama is even in any way personal. It's that it's simply I guess going back a little bit that um, like we love the miles and points space, and this is something like it is more than anything a passion project, and it has been, and it, it continues to be. And uh, I've been doing this since I was fifteen, like. Literally, this has been more than half of my life at this point. Um, and so it's just, you know, when you have a space like this and you have basically a venture capital company or VC backed company come in and their only goal really is sort of market share over anything else, um, it, you know, that creates a, a challenging situation. So it's nothing personal against anyone. They have some good people working there, they have some very friendly people, smart people. Some, not most, but some, um, but in terms of smart or friendly, well, I mean, which is fine, but you know, the fundamental difference well, is, and the thing is, is they probably have a lot of people who are smart in their field. Um, like, and they've done a really great job, like building their bench on the news side and bringing in like legitimate aviation journalists and things like that. Like that's all great. But so much of the public space is run by people who are great in their fields of design or social media or marketing or whatever, but like, they don't know anything about miles and points. Right. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest takeaway from all this is that, uh, you know, they claim to be a lifestyle brand. They claim to whatever, which is fine. But um, so so when stuff is not terribly accurate consistently and when their focus shifts to, you know, which credit card is best for slicing a cucumber um, or zucchini, was it? You it know, it's zucchini. just a different zucchini. OK, so, yeah. Um, you know, I, we would just at least appreciate if they didn't use our terms. Um, it would be nice. Our terms, so, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay. so. 
Um, what? Somebody's asking when I was in Iceland. I was in Iceland in February, which is actually shockingly a time I would recommend going. Like it was a slight packing challenge, but not horrific. And it wasn't super crowded. I really enjoyed it. I'd love to go back. They finally have like more decent hotels than when I was there, at least in Reykjavik, than eight years ago, ten years ago. I don't know. Right. I mean, there's a lot, a lot that's changed. There's a lot that's built yeah. up. Um, yeah, we stayed at one of two new Hilton hotels that are there, and um, I loved it. I loved the hotel. Of course, there's an Iceland doesn't have air conditioning. I'm pretty sure, like as a Yes, As having been thing, there in summer. Like they have yeah. so much heat. <laughs> Geothermal like heat. In addition to opening, which seems odd because that seems very, very nice for, like, you know, Iceland is not cheap, right. but you don't actually have a luxury hotel market right now other than, like, you know, a couple of places that are destinations. But uh, so it'll be interesting to see. I wonder what their pricing is going to be like because, like, even a not great hotel is not cheap. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting wow. because where the um, addition is, it's right next to the big like music hall. So it seems like they're clearly sort of going for that market, the upmarket people who are just going to come to Reykjavik, take some day tours. Because um, it's not like it's a it's a fine location. You know, Reykjavik is so small, it doesn't really matter. But um, I wonder when Wower is launching. I'm shocked. Have they not requested any CARES Act funding, unlike Avatar Airlines and uh, all the other fine airlines in our country? I don't know. Um, I did see that they're having conversations, and not so much credible conversations, but political posturing is suggesting that Iceland should nationalize Iceland Air. There's a is it fully privately owned right now? Mm-hmm. And they're pointing out that like all the other European airlines have, uh, you know, other have government support and things like that. Um, How terrible! That's an interesting. So much of that best best destination to go on a road trip. Okay, so I've honestly actually been considering that once things normalize, doing like a cross country road trip, not out of necessity or anything, but just because that kind of at this point sounds fun going under the assumption that you know domestic travel will be possible before international travel like it actually sounds i feel like such a you know german tourist coming to california and taking route 66 or whatever mm -hmm. and but what do you think how awful um, well i i mean i wanted to do that with you anyway like when people were talking about where should you go on your next road trip i was really thinking we should do like the american south like i how, think that'd be you say south we're talking like like Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, you know, do some like backcountry stuff. Like it's, it, they're places we would never go. Right. Like, so it seemed interesting. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of really beautiful places. I think a lot of it, it we talk about domestic travel opening up before international travel, but I think there might still be some States where it's like, mm, maybe not a good idea. Like it's very no. controversial right now because we're like 10 miles from the Idaho border and Idaho, I mean, the Idaho panhandle in general is they do what they want. So, <laughs> you know, there's, I don't want to say there's 0% physical distancing in the Idaho panhandle, but it's single digits of people who are like, I already live on 80 acres all by myself with just, you know, me and my guns and my land. So why do I need to have, you know, this lockdown? Like the movie Deliverance. Yes. Yes, the panhandle. So it's really contentious now because all the businesses in Idaho are open and none of the businesses in Washington are open. So, you know, that's, I think, something that becomes complicated when you start talking about like a domestic road trip is do you want to stay within the states that have it together? Or do you want to go to the states where things are just all open because... I mean, well, at some point, I'm just curious, like, if there are things to see specifically on a road trip that are, you know, obviously there are places we'd miss otherwise, but I guess that are worth seeing. Yeah, or, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, everything is worth seeing once, but. Well, 
And one of the things that is a uniquely American phenomenon, and especially like the Midwest and the South, are the roadside attractions. And I actually think we'd really enjoy seeing like, you're going down a stretch and there's like, there's the world's biggest rubber band ball. Like, why not? You know, and I think because you're such a observer of like people be and, meat quirks and people who are passionate, like I think you might enjoy all of that stuff. There's a big airplane. Hold on. It's, oh, it's not off in a 747. Ooh, from Santiago we have an Kalita Air Cargo. Seven hours, 40 minutes, two minutes to go. Ah. Uh, that's fun. I get very excited. I see still Cathay Pacific 747-8 cargo planes. They come from Anchorage and they go to Atlanta, which just. That's fun. Not as cool as the 64-year-old turboprop right, coming from San Pedro Sula. My but. plane spotting has taken a hit recently because it's finally spring in my yard. And so my unobstructed view all the way out to the tower now has a cherry tree in full blossom. So I'm not complaining. It's just uh, fewer plane spotting opportunities. Uh, also, so Kevin, the Dep wait, sorry, where was that a bit up? Deppler Farm or what is it in Iceland? Isn't that place like insane, like 4,000 a night or something? Yeah, I actually looked at that. So I was like, maybe in the dead of winter, it won't be as expensive. No, it was like $3,500 a night. And as you know, like $3,500 a night is not a price I'll be paying. But like, is there, is there a trick to this I'm missing or just good on you? Because like, I can appreciate it's if it's you. like a thousand or 1500, like there are places that are that expensive, but like, it was so expensive that I'm like, that is like Necker Island priced rather than, um, you know, just plainly expensive. So I was curious if there was, uh, um, more to it. Yeah. I, uh, that's why we stayed where we did. We went out to Hustafel instead because I wanted to have that more rural experience. But also, like, the thing is, uh, there's a really a market right now for people who want, like, these all-inclusive wellness retreats. And, like, that's just not us. So a lot of these things, like the Depler Farm, it includes, like, all, all of these meals and all of these excursions. And, like, some of that, that's nice for a minute. But... I'm that's curious kind of, about the... That's, I know, think, more the kind of trip that you take if you're somebody who maybe takes, like, one big trip a year, right? And you really want it to be an experience and you just want to be there. Yeah, Kevin's confirming that it is all-inclusive. And, uh, yeah, that's just a different experience. And trains intrigue me, but not really in the U.S., like, because Amtrak is a bit of a... I did once, when I was, like, a kid, a... Was it uh, Vancouver to San Francisco or something? Okay. Or maybe okay. it started in Seattle. Later. Yeah. And it took, I don't know how many, you know, we were delayed by like four hours mm -hmm. just standing there and you're just like, how the hell is this a thing? So it was yeah, enjoyable. Like to do, you can take the Empire Builder from here to Glacier National Park. I mean, it goes all the way to Chicago, but from here to Chicago. Where does it start? But Spokane. It goes Spokane to Chicago. Spokane's the starting point for it. Yeah, I mean, it splits in Spokane, and then you can do, like, a spur from Portland or Seattle. But, like, that's reflective of what the economic situation was at the time the railroads were built. Like, Spokane was the big hub city. Portland and Seattle were, like, backwoods mining and logging towns that didn't have paved roads and mostly had a lot of drunk sailors. Like, and Spokane was civilized. So... That route seems interesting to me, but I understand between like Chicago and Glacier, it's not necessarily that interesting anyway. So like between here and Glacier, and then it's like six hours. That seems like about the right amount of time. It sounds interesting, but uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. I'd rather drive at that point and go to like uh, very random places. You know, a, a while back we visited my mom, so we flew from. Or if you're driving from Miami to Tampa, usually you would go Alligator Alley, which goes all the way across. But so I saw this exit while I was driving across Alligator Alley, and I've always been intrigued by the name. So it was, hold on here, let me, because I was very, sorry, it is, what's the exit? There's like an exit. So anyway, there was like, ah, oh, crap, what's the name? Okay, so, well, you're looking it, that up. I can answer this. Someone's asking me how long it takes from Portland to Yellowstone. That's not where the train goes. 
The train goes to Glacier in Montana. It doesn't go to Yellowstone. Mm. From Portland, the timing is terrible because it leaves like nine in the morning. So maybe a day from Portland to Glacier, maybe like 12 or 13 hours. From, but from here, mm. not as long. Jeez. Anyways, where in BFE, Florida did you go? So anyway, about two thirds of the way down Alligator Alley, you can make a right turn and it goes towards Imokali or whatever, you know, I think they're mostly Native American names. Words. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was just very interesting because instead of driving on the highway, you like drive through these streets and there's like towns there in the middle of the Everglades. Oh, the reason we saw it was, the reason I was intrigued in the first place was, the only reason I thought of this was because we saw a billboard and they had like, what was it? Some super aspirational names like Venetian Palace or something, Homes from the 200s. And it was like yeah. at this exit, I'm like, wait, we're in the middle of nowhere. I thought there was nothing here. Um, so we couldn't help but, and then I looked it up on my phone. I was like, oh, we could actually turn here and then make it back around. It was very interesting because I'm like, yeah, wow. Yeah, so, and that's why I think that some place, like the Western side of the country is hard because you just go forever and it's like long, flat, straight highways. And there's some that are beautiful, like going in, especially in June. Um, but, uh, the American South, I think would be interesting because like, when would we ever go back in the bayous and things like that? We wouldn't. You like diners. So road trips are a great opportunity to experience diners. It's true. I feel like it'd be fun. Oh, thank you, Mike. Somebody, I don't actually even know how this works, but somebody just gave us money. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So thank you. We will, um, we will send that to, uh, the second harvest or something. That's really nice. Thank you. That's very sweet. I didn't know that and was However you did that, Mike, uh, however you did that super chat thing, I thank you. I don't know. Maybe we should do a tutorial on how to do that, but that's very maybe nice. We should learn thank how you. that works. Yes. Yeah, maybe we should learn how that works. That seems like that could come in handy. Any last questions? It is. Anyone else have anything exciting? Other right, than good. No- but let us know um, what you have for Sunday for brunch. If you guys have questions or topics, I feel like this was fun. Maybe it was just fun for me because I was actually drinking and was less fun for all of you guys. Drinking always helps. And uh, it's weird because otherwise I feel like it has gotten to the point where we are sufficiently far enough into this that it's no longer like, oh my God, look at what's happening. Um, (laughs) Which was like for the first few weeks, it was like all very interesting. Mm -hmm. Not specifically this, but I'm saying airline, whatever stuff. It's like, oh, what's going to happen now? Everybody's just like, Screw it. Um, so, well, we are. Other people are like storming their state legislature buildings, and that's that's true. That is true. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, but I appreciate all of you fine people staying home and hanging out with us and being safe and uh, the nice supporting independent content creators, which we really appreciate. That's a good. Uh, that's a good one. So, oh, wait, now lots of people are giving money. Thank you, Gil. That's very nice. Um, Okay, so maybe Sunday we'll do like a whole planned charity fundraiser thing or something for brunch now that we know that there's a button that does this. Um, That's very nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. uh, Hope everybody. You ain't been blush. Looks so cute. (laughs) That way, there we go. This is. uh... Happy Thursday. And yeah, uh, hit, hit the bell to get the reminder for Sunday. And um, we'll see you on the blog in the meantime. Let's do something fun on Sunday. We got to figure out something very fun. So, yeah, we'll do something fun. Thank you guys. Have a good Thank evening. You.